everybody. Uh, we're here with Liam Casey of PCH. PCH is a really interesting uh, hardware incubator in Silicon Valley based in San Francisco. And Liam's been at this for quite a while. He's from Ireland originally. And what he does essentially is provides an opportunity for entrepreneurs to build their products and take them through the entire manufacturing process from prefabrication, prototyping, all the way to working you through Shenzhen and then coming back with your product in the distribution model. Um, so my first question is, we're seeing this proliferation of hardware elements now. Uh, the last one that I saw, there's a smart frying pan, uh, there's a smart um, detector now. This is a Kickstarter campaign, I'm not making this up, of a, a little unit that you put on the back of your belt and it analyzes the gas that you pass <laughs> and it correlates it with the food that you eat and it gives you a, a readout on your smartphone, of course. So I'm curious where, from your perch, what, are, are we just going to get this sort of proliferation of crazy stuff or are you seeing interesting hardware uh, pieces moving through your pipeline and what, what distinguishes them? Yeah, no, we're seeing quite a lot of very good startups. I think the, the last one you referred to, I don't think they were very successful in their crowdfunding. Um, we are seeing some great companies uh, come through, right through from our, um, even our hackathons. When we run a hackathon, where we get people to come together for a weekend and you know, play with some hardware and come up with some prototypes, all the way through to our Highway 1, which is the accelerator, and then where we scale them into mass production. We're seeing some really interesting um, companies and ideas. I think, you know, there's a lot of talk about that there's a, a renaissance in hardware and where it comes from is there was actually a renaissance in prototyping. Um, that's what's changed. Uh, you know, I spent 10 years in the fashion industry before I started PCH and I could go to a fabric fair, a fabric mill and I could buy 60 meters of fabric, I could convert it into any garment I wanted, I had complete control over the process and I could ch stand on the production line with the, the cutter who was about to cut the fabric and last minute I could change and make a decision. That created a huge amount of innovation and creativity. When I entered into the tech world, um, I saw huge restrictions. Like people were coming with uh, these things like technology roadmaps, product roadmaps, two and three years. And that stifled innovation and creativity. But we saw a change in 2000, around 2008, we saw a change where um, we saw entrepreneurs, engineers going to their garages and taking these new uh, tools, like new products like Arduino, Raspberry Pi, um, Linux, Android, 3D printing, uh, and then crowdfunding. And they were actually coming up with great prototyping. And it's amazing, and the, the moment of creation and innovation in hardware is that first prototype. So is it really the 3D printing technology that has become so ubiquitous that enables that's what's that creating this program. prototyping renaissance, yep. for sure. Yep, yep. It's not creating a manufacturing renaissance or a hardware renaissance. Right. The, the, the hardware is coming from that. But at the end of the day, you know, there has to be a demand and there has to be a market there for the product. So a, uh, an entrepreneur comes to you and they may have plans drawn on paper or just an idea, right? And they can work with the mechanical engineers that you have on your team uh, to actually fabricate a prototype that then can be taken to China for manufacture. What's the, what's the business model there for you and for the entrepreneur? So for us, what we do is when we see an idea, and again, a lot of the time, we have a, an application process for Highway 1, which is open at the moment for anybody who wants to make hardware. Um, they come with an idea for a product, and we'll spend a lot of time with them understanding, do they have an idea for the business and to build a company? Um, once they do, then we give them you know, $50,000. They come to San Francisco. They stay for four months. Uh, in San Francisco, including we take them to China for two weeks, um, where we actually give them mentors, we give them access to our engineering team, uh, we help them how to you know, build, a build a product, you know, construct a bomb, develop materials, um, take them through the whole process. They meet um, entrepreneurs from, they meet uh, you know, people from different businesses and different industries like retail, they'll meet um, e-commerce companies, they'll meet all of the, what's needed to build their product, not just the engineering part. Um, and we put a huge focus because at the end of the day, you know, I use the acronym PCV, which for, to, for us is product, company, and business. So they can get excited about the product, but really, you know, are they go is there a business there? 
And can they build a company at the end of the day? Because that's what we look for when, when we bring them to scale. So you're taking a stake in them in exchange for this $50,000 residency Yeah, we take program, uh, single right? digit uh, equity. Got it. Okay. Um, and <clears throat> so that there's some risk on your part there, that the thing oh, yeah. may go nowhere. But a big part of your, the biggest part of your business from a revenue standpoint is actually working on manufacturing for large companies, correct? Correct. And so what, what exactly do you do for a Fortune 500 company? So say? large companies come to us with an idea for, I mean, they'll have, some of them will have an idea for a product. We'll take them through the, the engineering, the manufacturing, the packaging, the logistics. Um, a huge part of it is the, you know, the engineering for what we call DFM, design for manufacture. So it, you design the product so that it's easy to manufacture on a mass production scale. Um, and then we'll look at the, the, pa the packaging. In the packaging, you have to think about a few things. One is the out-of-box experience. So when you get that product and you take it out of the box, that it's a, a wow experience, that it's, the consumer likes it. Um, but also, there's the whole transportation of it. And but you, would, you would think these big companies, I mean, it's rumored you work with Apple. You would think they have a lot of this expertise themselves. Oh yeah, I mean, a lot of the bigger companies will have all the expertise, but they look at a company like us that has an end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain and understanding of how to do it. Um, and we work with different companies at different stages of the process. Some of them, we do the entire process. Um, and a again, a big part of it, I think they come to us because we've been at this 19 years. So we have a lot of experience. Right. And it's interesting when you, um, I think the big companies today have a renewed interest in what we do because of, you know, there's such value in being able to interact with startups. The amount of innovation and creativity that comes out of interacting with the startups that are hackathons, that are at a high one process, is phenomenal. So and what's just your, being able to interact. What's your annual revenue now? Um, again, we're a private company. We don't disclose revenue. Last year was over uh, a billion. We don't one get billion disclose. in revenue in one year. Yes. That's pretty impressive. So, back to the incubation side. What, what, what do you tell a young entrepreneur who has an idea? What, what should they do before they walk in your door? What so they have they to come create? to us with a, I mean, okay, they have to come with an idea for the, the product and right. why it's innovative, you know. At the, end, at the end of the day, a lot of these great products we're seeing today is software in a box. And you have to look at the makeup of a team. And you have to see, you know, do they have the ability to actually build a competitive product? And do they have the ability to go out and win in the marketplace? Can they sell? Um, can they win on the high street? So and you that's want huge. somebody who's actually formed a company in effect already. They have a right. team. They, okay. and, yeah, they, have, they have, have a team, a team and they have a passion for what they're doing. Right. Um, and again, some of the, the best companies that we interact with today in the startup space have originated because they've been great software people and they worked in, worked in, uh, in startups in the valley in, in software in the past. And, and how developed does the idea for the product have to be? Do there have to be mechanical drawings? Do they have to, what, what is it that you want to see when they start the process with you? It has to, they have to be able to show us how it works or how, how it would work. You know, we'll bring in our engineers and our experts on how to bring it all together. Right. Um, and it's more about the, the business model and the, the, you know, why there's a use case for it. So I know you don't, you don't, you can't really talk about particular projects, but give us some ideas of the trends of the kinds of products that you're seeing coming through a lot that are really popular and hot right now. So when we look at, we, the trends we pick up very early on are at our hackathons where um, you will bring in people with, um, you know, from all over the world, we run them in multiple cities. And we see trends, I think the, the most recent one is the sensors. So it's actually sensor to sensor shopping, we call it. So yeah. you can build a smart shelf uh, and they build prototypes over the weekend. So you have a, a measuring um, device that measures a, say, a shelf and what's in a shelf. And it can be either with um, weight um, or other detection. Um, and then when something, if, if weight is reduced, it means there's a usage, which triggers a message to an e-commerce company to refill. Um, we've seen that, we've seen it in a use case for medicine. We've seen it in a use case for stuff like coffee. So shelving and is big right now. Smart that shelves. Was, that was smart shelves. That was one of the things we saw. And it, that came up from two of our, um, two of our hackathons, which was very interesting. interesting because it was a completely different use case, but the same. Same kind of basic yeah. idea, right? So where does, it, 
Where does the putting a chip in something where graduate graduate to something more sophisticated? How do you what do you tell the entrepreneur? And and that's where we look at the when we when they, when they come with the idea for the product. So if we discover somebody like that at a at a hackathon, then the next stage is not necessarily the company. It's thinking about the business. Is there a business case there? How would it work in the business? And you know who would why would it be important to somebody? So the smart frying pan may not be something that would we'd get excited about as a business. Right. Um, but something like a, the smart shelves, of course, yep. because there's a big efficiency to be achieved there. Now, suppose an entrepreneur has a fairly well-developed well idea, has a team, but has not made the window for your, for your uh, Highway 1 incubation program. Can they just come to you as a, as a vendor, essentially, and say, we want you to make this? And, Oh, and then, again, they're, then we, they're paying you for that. Yeah, because right? we have a later stage program that is called PCH Access. And we take, we take startups and you know, take companies in there. Even if they've been to other um, accelerators, we're happy to bring them in there. Because at the end of the day, if we think there's a business case there and there's a, a good product and they have the ability to build a company, then you know, we're going to be interested in helping them scale anyway, for sure. And in that scenario, are you more interested in taking equity or, or taking money? The equity is an option. I mean, for us, we want to build big companies with them. So, I mean, right. the, the equity is always an option, but it's not always the only thing. What about security? Are you seeing the entrepreneurs worrying about security enough in their devices? I think, you know, we're a European headquarter company, so data protection is hugely important. Yep. It's very tight, and we have to be very careful on that. Um, and, it's, it's, a, it's with a lot of the companies that you're seeing coming up in the wild, um, the, some of the ones you mentioned, I mean, I'm not sure security is high on their agenda. Um, and do you, do you kind over of us, try it to has, push it's, them? It's, it's hugely important. And you push them in that Yeah, in absolutely. That and again, yeah, right. we, we, yeah. All those things, I mean, that's why I think companies come to us is because we have a very strong sustainability program as well. And I think that's a built in, that for a startup is going to be really hard to do on their own, yeah. whereas we actually have it built into how we operate, which is really important. So you have an interesting front row seat, a little different from a traditional VC, but in the sort of froth that is collecting in the valley right now. And as one of the guests yesterday said, we're a long way from the bottom. Um, what's your view of where tech is right now in its life cycle? Should, should people be concerned that we're potentially getting very close to a place where things have to correct? You know, I think we're a 19-year-old company. We were through a bubble in 2000, bubble in 2008. Um, we spot the trends and we kind of, you know, we know when people are, when, when it gets overheated. We when kind of, when it's experience. starting to run out of gas, right? We're, yeah. When we're not seeing, I think we're, because our business is so focused on, we know where production lines are, we know where product is, we know where there's a market, we, we're so close to the demand and the source. You know, it gives us a good feel for it. The good thing is that in our world, risk is always built up in inventory. Um, so our model is about reducing the inventory in the chain. And that's, you know, for us, that, you know, even if it gets hugely overheated, we still have a dashboard that gives us a visibility into the supply chain that's extremely lean. What are the challenges, the biggest challenges you face in dealing with China as much as you do? I, am, I think we've been very lucky because when I went to China first, I spent the first two years working alone and most of it based in China. Um, so we kind of evolved and we grew up inside in China um, and we kind of appeared there. So we've had no Guanxi, which is connections. Um, we've never been subjected to any challenges from uh, Guanxi relationships and not having those relationships. Um, I think we grew, up, we grew the company in a city called Shenzhen, that when I went there in 96 had a population of 3 million people. Today it has a population of somewhere in the region of 18 million. So when you've got that much growth and that much um, pace going on there, um, a company like ours is tiny and we don't register on the radar, really but yet we can be very effective. And I think um, the way we've built the company in there is, you know, we've got a fantastic Chinese team in there and it's been, um, you know, I think we've been very lucky. I mean, we're the right place, right time. There's a Chinese saying um, that means being in the right place at the right time with the right people. What keeps you up at night? What are you most worried about in terms of the continued trajectory of your business? 
what keeps me up at night? Uh, I think the big thing is just awareness of what's happening in different parts of the world. Um, because there's, there's a huge disconnect sometimes. When you look at, you know, in Silicon Valley, we talk about like the, the successful, the great successful startups like Nest, Beats, uh, Oculus, uh, GoPro. And you look at those companies and like, they're, you know, three, two, three, five billion, six billion dollars. But yet you look in China, you've got a company like Xiaomi, it's 46 billion dollars. And it's that gap of understanding and a huge amount of it is just using best in class practices in different geographies to actually to be able to achieve uh, a much different outcome. And that's the part for us. How do I bring that awareness to Silicon Valley, what we see in China, and how do I actually convince people that a company producing a piece of hardware can be worth $46 billion in Silicon Valley? Great place to stop. Thank you very much, everybody. Liam Casey. Thank you.